Three months ago, I did a Q2 review of the Steam Deck, but a lot's changed since then. Additionally, we've now reached Q3, and that means a new group of people are going to be able to finally put their order in for a Steam Deck. As a result of both of those things, I think it's time for my Q3 review. As last time, there's going to be a lot to cover. I'd like this to be a good first stop for anyone putting in a Steam Deck order. So of course, I've broken this up into chapters if you need to skip around or refer back to this in the future. And real quick before we get started, this video is sponsored by JSOX who has been hard at work making some accessories tailored specifically to the Steam Deck and I'm going to be giving some of those away. I'll cover them a bit more in the accessories section, but in the meantime, stay tuned. With that, let's start with buying your Steam Deck. Unfortunately, Q3 is a very vague ETA. All you know is that you are estimated to get your chance to order a Steam Deck between now and September 30th. Valve does this by sending a batch of emails twice a week, once on Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific time and once on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So you'll want to check your inbox every Monday and Thursday to see if you've received your email, which will look something like this. You'll also get a notification in Steam that looks like this. Once you get your email, you have three days to order the Steam Deck from the Steam Store. If you miss your window, don't worry. Open a ticket with Steam support and they should be able to take care of you. Now, there are some tools that may help you get a better idea of when to expect your email. One of those is called DeckBot. If you go to the Steam Deck subreddit, there are instructions for messaging DeckBot. DeckBot will respond back with like a progress bar of sorts, letting you know how close you are to getting your email. That said, I would take these tools with a grain of salt, not because they're bad tools, they're very well made, but they rely on data that we're getting less and less of as we move through the queue. As a result, I would say there's no reliable ETA other than what Valve is able to give us, which right now remains a three month window for the Q3 folks. Finally, if you're not in the Q3 queue, but you've placed your reservations, then you must be in the after Q3 group. As of right now, we have no clue what after Q3 means. For some people, it's going to mean Q4 2022, but for others, it will be even later than that. So to that end, if you have not placed your reservation, but you are even remotely interested in the Steam Deck, I would encourage you to go ahead and place that reservation. That will at least put you in the queue, and if you change your mind, the $5 deposit is completely refundable at any time. Once your order is placed, there is the matter of shipping. It will take a few days for your order to actually leave the warehouse and then Valve will ship it with whatever two day shipping option is available from the carrier in your region. For the US, it's FedEx two day shipping, which mind you is two business days and does not include the weekend. Also in the US, it will be shipping from Valve's warehouse located in Illinois. On the subject of delivery, there has been concern in the past of your package getting stolen or damaged by the carrier. It seems that these are mostly remote incidents and it's unlikely to happen to you. If it does happen to you, however, record them as best you can and contact Steam support to help you out. Remember that the carrier is a customer of Valve's and that they have a working relationship, so even in the unlikely event that something does happen, that issue will eventually get resolved. So while your Steam Deck is on the way, I'm sure many of you will be looking to pass the time by watching Steam Deck videos and reading up on the Steam Deck. To that end, I'm going to share a few helpful resources. First up are Valve's own communication channels. They regularly release videos on their YouTube channel that go over Steam Deck updates that have happened in the prior few weeks or months. That's a good way to get a recap of features that have been added since launch, and it's a good way to stay up to date as well. They also use the Twitter handle at OnDeck. This Twitter account will post about any major updates in real time, and it's not a very noisy account, so it's safe to turn notifications on for this one if you're that interested. For non-official resources, I would start with the Steam Deck Discord and Steam Deck subreddit. Links will be in the description. These are both helpful enthusiast communities around the Steam Deck. And if you're looking for YouTube based resources, let me recommend, well, myself. If this is your first time on my channel, I make Steam Deck news videos every week and occasionally I'll make guides like the one I did for Emmy Deck. So yeah, subscribe if you'd like to see more of that. Additionally, there are folks like Gardner Bryant, Deck Ready, and Gaming on Linux who very regularly publish Steam Deck videos. I'd highly recommend checking them out. Finally, I also recommend checking out sdeck.wiki. This wiki shares a bunch of other resources you can look into on your own, including ShareDeck, which allows people to share their own Steam configurations for Steam games. Next up, let's get into some accessories. I'll be covering a wide variety of accessories, but in particular today, I'm focusing on accessories from our sponsor, JSOX. JSOX has been working on creating accessories tailored specifically for the Steam Deck, and I love that these are targeted at the Steam Deck, and I wanted to cover them here. The most important of these is their Steam Deck dock. 
with the official Steam Deck dock being delayed, this is the first USB-C dock made specifically for the Steam Deck. The first thing I noticed when I picked this up was the build quality. There's a little weight to it and it's built with an aluminum alloy. Additionally, the USB-C cable is particularly sturdy, so the whole dock has a premium feel to it. Furthermore, you can tell this was made for the Steam Deck and even resembles the renders of the official Steam Deck dock. You can stand the Steam Deck up in a slot which has a built-in anti-slip grip. The USB-C connector is angled, which is a nice touch so that the cable isn't sticking up out of the Steam Deck. As for the ports on this, there is an Ethernet port. The one I have here is 100 megabits per second, but they are now also selling an upgraded dock with gigabit, so consider going with that if you want higher throughput. On the back, there's a USB-C port with a 100 watt power pass-through, one HDMI 2.0 port and two USB-A ports for your USB accessories. I have this mini keyboard that I often use and like to leave plugged into the dock. The HDMI port is capable of 4K resolution at 60 FPS. Now, I have an older TCL model TV where the 4K 60 wasn't working, but the other displays I tested worked just fine. I reported that compatibility issue with JSOX and they are already looking into it, which is pretty cool. When the Steam Deck first launched, I criticized the state of dock play on the Steam Deck. It's still not perfect, but it's gotten a lot better and I'm enjoying using this dock. When the dock is attached and connected to a display, the Steam Deck screen will be blank and the video will come through the TV or monitor. By default, games will still launch in 720p, but you can set the maximum resolution in the game settings in Steam. From there, you can launch a game and set the resolution to something higher. I like running something like a Soul Android Cactus at 1440p because it can still get 60fps and it looks great at this resolution on my big screen. Overall, it's pretty awesome that this dock exists. I've used other docks and I really wanted something where I could stand a deck up and have an angle connector just like the renders of the official dock. I think it just looks a lot cleaner like this in your setup, so take a look at the link in the description if you're interested in this dock. By the way, they also sell a Steam Deck stand and a right angled USB-C connector. So even if you already have a dock that you want to use, you can still kind of get the full experience with these accessories. They also sent me two cases that are both really, really good. One of them has these bumps for extra grips, and then there's this one which has a kickstand. Of course, they both help to protect the Steam Deck, but I love the one with the kickstand. It's obviously really practical, but I also just like the clean look. From the front, you can't even tell that a case is on it. Even on the back, the design language feels in line with the Steam Deck itself, so it all looks very natural. I recommend checking that out as well. If you're further concerned with protecting your Steam Deck, they also sell tempered glass screen protectors. These are great because they include two in the package as well as two sets of wipes and even a bubble remover. So this is once again a very quality set. In any case, all of these accessories and more are available on their site, so follow my link in the description and in the pinned comment. And yeah, thanks to JSOX for sending these out and sponsoring this video, but that's not all. They're letting me give away these bad boys, so I'm going to send a Steam Deck care package to one viewer. It's going to include one dock, one case, and one screen protector set. Look for the pinned comment for instructions on how to join the giveaway, but yeah, I'm very excited to be sending a care package to one of y'all. A quick note on buying games and Steam Deck compatibility, you probably already know that Valve has a rating system for compatibility, so rather than do a deep dive on that, I'd like to say that the vast majority of games are still unrated and it's going to remain that way for some time. I would urge you to not be scared away from a game that is unrated, even if you are brand new to PC gaming. Many games just work and even when they don't, Steam refunds are very generous. As long as you request a refund within 2 weeks with less than 2 hours of play, you should be granted your refund with no problem. There are also sometimes ways to get incompatible games to work if you're curious about a specific game and willing to do a little tinkering then try doing a search for that game and Steam Deck or that game and the word Proton and you're likely to find some very helpful resources. Finally, demos. There are a lot of demos, don't forget to try those. A couple times a year Steam has an event they call Nextfest where developers of upcoming games release demos. Lots and lots of demos. It's cool to check these out, discover new things, and have a chance to add upcoming games to your wishlist. So yeah, put that on your calendar. So honestly, the first thing you should do when you get your Steam Deck is install and play a Steam game, obviously. But let's take a tour around, shall we? Funny enough, a lot of the stuff I'm going to cover in this section was added in the last three months, which goes to show how fast the Steam Deck has evolved since launch. So in addition to your usual controls, you have a gyro, two touchpads, and two extra buttons, Steam on the left and quick access on the right. Both of these buttons can be used for some quick actions in what are called button cord shortcuts. Hold the Steam button to see your options. 
Here you see that holding the Steam button and then pressing R1 will get you a screenshot, but you may not know that holding the quick access button and pressing R1 will do the exact same thing. Or a more helpful case would be to hold the quick access button and move the analog stick up or down to adjust the brightness. So just remember that these exist and that you can hold the Steam button to see what your options are. As for the menus themselves, you'll get to know the quick access menu quickly since it's super helpful. For the COG menu here, there are quick settings for brightness, volume, mic volume, rumble, and haptics. The menu with the battery is a bit of the secret Steam Deck sauce. You, you can enable various levels of a performance overlay depending on how deep you want to get. Off is no overlay, level 1 displays only the frame rate, level 2 adds high level usage stats and frame timing, and then it gets deeper from there with the last level including clock speeds and usage stats for each core. You can also enable an advanced view to tinker with additional settings. Mind you, this is not necessary, but it could be helpful if you're trying to save some extra battery life or something like that. So let's take a quick look at these settings. The first is refresh rate. This sets the refresh rate of the Steam Deck display so you can set it anywhere between 40 hertz and 60 hertz. If the game you're playing is not gonna hit 60 FPS anyway, but it's able to do 40, then it's a good idea to lower the refresh rate and this will result in a much smoother looking and feeling experience overall. From here, you can also set the max frame rate. Some people leave the refresh rate to 60 hertz, but lock the frame rate to 30. This is helpful for really demanding games that you can't even get to 40 FPS consistently. Furthermore, reducing the frame rate to 30 FPS can save you some additional battery life if you're trying to squeeze every single drop out. On that note, there's also the 15 FPS option, but that would be reserved for games like visual novels or puzzle games that can be played at very low FPS to once again save some battery life. Then you can get into more granular control like the TDB control which lets you specify a max power draw and the GPU clock control which lets you set a clock speed for the GPU. I rarely touch these but they could be helpful if you're looking for a little finer control. Finally, you can save these all as per game settings. So if you want 40Hz for God of War but 60Hz for Celeste, that's no problem. Over in the settings menu, there's just a couple things I really want to point out here. Steam Deck can sometimes get really frequent updates and sometimes people will talk about Steam OS updates versus Steam updates or beta channel versus stable channel. For most of you, I would leave these set to stable options in both. That means you'll get updates after an additional round of testing from some real life users. If you want more frequent updates, then you can select the beta option on these and that will get you new features sooner, but you'll effectively be part of the testing group. And if you really want to be on the bleeding edge, you can opt into the preview channel, but even Valve warns you you could encounter some issues. You can also enable a lock screen over in the security menu. I have all of these enabled, but it's up to you depending on how you use your Steam Deck. Of course, there's also the Bluetooth menu where you can pair your headsets, controllers, or any other accessories. The controller menu has some calibration tools which can be really handy, especially for external controllers. Also, in the downloads menu, you may want to consider turning off downloads during gameplay since the downloads can sometimes be a major hit on the CPU. Finally, there's a storage menu that shows what games you have installed on either the SSD or the microSD card that you have. I find this helpful for managing my storage, but also it seems to come in handy whenever I want to make sure that my microSD card is seated and inserted properly. There are a ton of Steam features, and I'm not going to cover them in detail, but I want to let you know that they exist so you can do some additional searching if you're curious. First is Steam Input, which is incredibly powerful. You can not only remap every button, but you can configure trackpad and gyro for aiming in basically any game where you would need to aim. Or you can create custom touch menus that contain macros, or you can create your own virtual keyboard as Mosquito does in his video that I've shared before. Or you can create action sets so that you have one set of controls when driving and another set of controls when on foot. Or you can configure analog triggers so that a soft pull doesn't aim down sights but a hard pull will fire your weapon. And finally you can share your Steam input profiles with other people. If a game is made with Steam input in mind then the options get even better. Steam input is unlike any input mapping I've ever seen and it can be a bit daunting but it's truly truly worth it in my mind. There's also Remote Play Together which adds online play to many games that are local multiplayer only. If you fire up a game like Assault Android Cactus, you'll have a new icon at the top of the quick access menu for Remote Play Together where you can invite any of your Steam friends to play in the same session with you. Like Remote Play Together, Steam also has voice chat built into the quick access menu so that's another feature you could try. As for other features, most modern games have cloud saves so you can pick up from another device pretty seamlessly and some games have built in mod support with Steam Workshop. And you can use Remote Play to either stream games from the deck or to the deck. For example, say if you want to play the Steam Deck game on your big screen but you don't have a dock. Well, if you have a Steam app installed on your TV, 
then you can stream from your deck to your TV while using the deck as a controller. So yeah, Steam is a really flexible platform with a lot of great features that have been added over the years. If you want to use the desktop side of the Steam Deck, you can go to the power menu and select exit to desktop. There are a number of ways to install applications on SteamOS, but the first place I always look is on the Discover Software Center. The apps here are called Flatpaks, and there is a Flatpak for all sorts of stuff, including emulators and non-Steam game launchers like Heroic Games and Lutris. It's important to note that while Steam is running, you will be using a desktop controller profile that you can configure. I watched this tutorial by Mosquito on how to make a better desktop profile, and it's really awesome. Now, I feel like a pro at using the desktop without attaching a mouse and keyboard. I configured it even beyond what he suggested so that now I can Alt-Tab, go back and forward in the browser, and stuff like that. So yeah, if you're interested in something like that, be sure to watch Mosquito's video, link is in the description. I've been meaning to make a guide for non-Steam games, but honestly I don't play that many non-Steam games. The only exception to that is the Epic Games Store, so I'm going to walk you through how to play Epic Games here. You'll want to download the Heroic Game Launcher from the Discover Store. I use the Dracula theme, I think it looks great. You can log into either GOG or Epic Games, so go ahead and log in. This should populate your library, so navigate that and install a game. I have Sifu, Kina, and FF7 installed. After the game is installed, you'll need to do a quick initial configuration. Just hover over the game and click the cog to select the Wine version. Wine and Proton are what allow you to run games that are made for Windows on Linux. If you don't know for sure, just start with the latest version of Proton available. It's a good time to note that not every game on Epic is going to be compatible on Linux. Many games, like the ones I have installed here, are compatible, but other games like Fortnite just won't work. Okay, now your game should be able to run. You can add the Heroic Launcher to Steam, or you can add individual games to Steam as well. I added my Heroic games to Steam by using an app called Boiler. Download Boiler from Discover, and when you run it, you'll need to select what you wish to import. I select my installed EGS games, but then I unselect everything else. In the settings menu, you can also add a Steam Grid DB API key to make sure that you get cover art for all your Epic games. There are instructions for how to get an API key in the Boiler README on the GitHub page. Finally, you click the Run button at the bottom, and that will import your installed Heroic games into Steam so that you can launch them in gaming mode with all the nice things that come with gaming mode like the performance overlay and frame limiting controls. Unfortunately, Amazon games don't work, but Ubisoft and EA launchers should mostly work. There are video guides for all of those out there, so I recommend doing a quick search on those. And finally, for emulation purposes, I highly recommend Emudeck. Just go to emudeck.com and follow the instructions there. It's actually really, really easy. But if you want a deep dive on that, then go ahead and watch my Emudeck Mega Guide, where I cover everything. <laughs> everything that you could need to know about Emudeck, it's in that video. Steam Deck is not only a PC, but it's a single unified model that has a relatively large and enthusiastic user base. So when it comes to mods and customizations, nothing beats the Steam Deck. A while ago I made a video covering every category of Steam Deck mods that I could think of, and since then I've been including community spotlight segments in all my videos. I'll cover a couple important ones here. First is the plugin loader. This will let you add custom functionality to the quick access using plugins. I find that the plugin loader can sometimes affect the stability of the OS, but it's completely reversible and I consider it at least worth trying if some of the plugins are interesting to you. For example, there's a Spotify media player and also a plugin that allows you to have finer control of the CPU. There are also custom skins made by people in the Steam Deck community. I've highlighted some cool ones by Mosquito, including this portal design and a new cyberpunk design. Check those out on his Etsy shop. Also, on the subject of customizations, you can install Windows or other alternative operating systems on the Steam Deck. Some people have even figured out how to dual boot. Windows works much better than it did just a few months ago. But even though the compatibility is better than SteamOS, I still prefer SteamOS and I personally would recommend sticking to that. In the last subject for today is repairs. If you run into any issues with your Steam Deck, go ahead and open a Steam support ticket. They're going to ask you to try a few things before starting an RMA anyway. For example, they may ask you to re-image your Steam Deck. In any case, once they initiate an RMA, it's pretty straightforward. The whole thing takes about two to three weeks, so yeah, plan for that. If you want to do a self-repair, then you can see if the parts you want are still available on the official iFixit repair store. They're selling virtually everything, but they're often out of stock as well. There are a few teardown and repair videos out there, so you can search those up, and I hope to make one as well. 
So that's it folks, that's my Q3 review of the Steam Deck. If you're still with me, I'm impressed, especially for those of you that have been following this channel for a while. I'm sure that a lot of this was redundant, but the Steam Deck has grown a lot in three short months and I thought it was really important to capture that all in one place. I'm super happy with my Steam Deck and really about my only complaint is the D-pad. I think it's good, but not great. And there's still a lot more to come, I think. I know that Valve has their sights set on the Steam Deck dock, but even beyond that, I think the future is bright. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And thanks again to JSOX for sponsoring this video and helping me build a care package for one lucky person. Don't forget to follow the instructions in the pinned comment. All right, that gang out. Goodbye.